Happy Saturday! Since the U.S. holiday of Thanksgiving is coming up, today we are sharing our episode on Sarah Josepha Hale, who was one of the people who really drove the effort to make Thanksgiving a national holiday. At the time, the holiday was not associated with a fictionalized or romanticized story about a first Thanksgiving celebration supposedly bringing together indigenous people and colonists, but Hale was hoping a national holiday for giving thanks would help keep the nation together as it became increasingly divided over the issue of slavery. This originally came out on August 28, 2019, so enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy B. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Lately, I've been thinking a lot about etiquette on the internet and how sometimes there's sort of not any, and how etiquette isn't something that just springs forth from people unprompted. The idea of what is and isn't polite or rude has to be kind of cultivated and created and reinforced intentionally, including through things like etiquette manuals and advice columns and magazines. And that whole line of thought led me to something that has been on my list for a long time and has also been requested by a lot of our listeners. That's Godie's Ladies Book and its editor, Sarah Josepha Hale. I will say that I have heard historians and archivists say this as Godies and as Gaudies. I have also on occasion heard good days. I think that's just people trying to make it sound fancy. I, that, that does sound like an attempt for fanciness. Yeah. A bunch of folks that I have listened to from Vassar, who she was associated with, uh, all said goaties. So that's the one that we're going to go with. This was the most popular magazine in the United States in the middle of the 19th century. And although it's mostly well-known at this point for its hand-tinted fashion plates, the content of the magazine was this collection of all kinds of material, including poetry and fiction and household tips and music and, yes, etiquette. And it was incredibly influential in terms of both the actual magazine content and Hale's work outside of his pages in a lot of ways that are still felt today. In Europe, the first magazines were launched in the 17th century thanks to advances in printing technology and mail distribution, as well as increased literacy rates. The word magazine is much older than that, but it was first used to describe a periodical filled with works by various writers, often on a range of subjects aimed at a general audience, and that was in 1731. That was when Edward Cave started publishing The Gentleman's Magazine. He called it a magazine because of the word's earlier meaning of story. Storehouse. The Gentleman's Magazine was meant to be a storehouse of knowledge. Magazines aimed specifically at women were part of this whole ecosystem by 1759. That's when the Royal Female Magazine, or the Ladies' General Repository of Pleasure and Improvement, was first published in England. In the United States, the first women's magazine was called Ladies' Magazine, and it was founded in 1792. Various women's magazines came and went on both sides of the Atlantic. In the U.S., most of them folded within a year or two until Sarah Josepha Hale started publishing her Ladies' Magazine, which was the first women's magazine in the U.S. that lasted more than five years. And that is, in fact, a different Ladies' Magazine than the one that was founded in 1792. And we're going to go back up for a minute and talk about how Hale got there. She was born Sarah Josepha Buell in Newport, New Hampshire on October 24, 1788. Her parents were Captain Gordon Buell and Martha Whittlesey Buell, and her father had fought in the Revolutionary War. Sarah was the third of their four children. Sarah's parents thought that girls should have access to education, and for the Buell daughters, that meant being tutored at home by their mother along with their brothers. It did not, however, mean that Sarah could go to college. Of all her siblings, Sarah was closest to her brother Horatio, and when he went to Dartmouth, he actively encouraged her self-study, and he shared his books with her when he was home. In her words, quote, he seemed very unwilling that I should be deprived of all his collegiate advantages. Sarah became a teacher when she was 18, and in 1813, when she was 25, she married David Hale, who was a lawyer. David encouraged her to continue educating herself. Again, in her words, quote, We commenced, soon after our marriage, a system of study and reading, which we pursued while he lived. The hours allowed were from 8 o'clock in the evening till 10, two hours in the 24. 
How I enjoyed those hours. In all our mental pursuits, it seemed the aim of my husband to enlighten my reason, strengthen my judgment, and give me confidence in my own powers of mind, which he estimated much higher than I. But this approbation which he bestowed on my talents has been of great encouragement to me in attempting the duties that have since become my portion. Sadly, David did not live long. He died of pneumonia in 1822, nine years into their marriage. By then, they had four children together. They were David, Horatio, Frances Ann, and Sarah Josepha. The elder Sarah was pregnant with their fifth child, William, who was born not long after his father's death. Sarah was understandably devastated, and she wore black for the rest of her life, although this was also influenced by the fact that she found black flattering on her, and she also thought it made her look taller. Sarah knew that she was going to have to work to support her family, but that a teacher's salary was never going to be enough to support her and five children. Before her marriage, she hadn't even been supporting herself on teacher's pay. She'd been living at home and using that salary to help cover her father's medical expenses. David had been a Freemason, though, and his brothers at the Masonic Lodge helped get Sarah and her sister-in-law, Hannah, established with a millinery business. That, along with dressmaking, was one of the very few business opportunities that was considered appropriate for middle-class women. The Masonic Lodge also funded the publication of a book of poetry that Sarah had written that was called The Genius of Oblivion and Other Original Poems, and it was published under the byline, A Lady of New Hampshire. Sarah earned enough money from this book that she was able to leave Hannah in charge of what actually seems to have become quite a thriving millinery business. And instead, Sarah focused on writing. Sarah submitted poems and stories to magazines and journals, and in 1827, she published a novel called Northwood, A Tale of New England. Northwood contrasted a woman's life in New England to what she imagined to be a woman's life in the South. At this point, Hale was really concerned that the issue of slavery was going to lead to a civil war or otherwise just destroy the country. And Northwood reflects these fears as well as the era's prevailing racism and Hale's own biases. The book condemns the institution of slavery and the idea of a widening divide between the North and the South, while also treating white women of both the North and the South with a lot of sympathy. Northwood was very well received, and it caught the eye of the Reverend John Loris Blake, who approached Hale about starting a magazine for women. This was not an easy decision for her. If the magazine was successful, she would probably make enough money to send all five of her children to college. But taking the job was also going to mean leaving her older children with relatives while she moved to Boston to work. Her oldest child, David, was 13 at this point and was getting ready to head to West Point. But the rest of her children were years away from leaving home, and her youngest child was only five. In the end, Hale did take this job. She spent a few months at home in New Hampshire preparing and planning out the magazine's first issues before sending her middle three children to live with various aunts and uncles. She took William with her when she left for Boston in the spring of 1828. And we'll talk about that magazine after we first pause for a little sponsor break. The magazine that Sarah Josepha Hale launched in 1828 was initially known as Ladies Magazine and Literary Gazette. It's believed to be the first magazine edited by a woman. After a while, its name was shortened to just Ladies Magazine and then expanded to American Ladies Magazine. This was supposed to distinguish it from a different ladies magazine that was being published in Britain and also to highlight what Hale saw as the magazine's American focus. At the time, most magazines being published in the United States were being created primarily through a practice called clipping. That was just republishing material from other magazines without any kind of acknowledgement or attribution or payment to its original creators. Most of the time, the clipped content in the U.S. was coming from British publications. And we have talked a little bit about uh, publications that worked in that style when we have talked about... um, Poe's era and his rivals, and also mm. <laughs> also other uh, other people that worked in in literary efforts, etc. It came up, I think, in in our Windsor McKay episodes, possibly. Um, but Hale 
bless her, did not approve of this practice of clipping. And she wanted this to be an American magazine by and for American women, meaning middle and upper class white women. She did the vast majority of the original writing herself. And the magazine's pages included poetry, fiction, essays, news articles, household tips, and editorials where she advocated things like property rights for married women. Some things that Hale did not want this magazine to include were fashion plates. These were illustrations of people in fashionable clothing and appealing surroundings, usually done as etchings or engravings. She really wanted her magazine to be dedicated to the education and enrichment of women, and that did not, in her mind, include fashion. In her words, quote, there is no part of our duty as editor of a ladies' journal which we feel so reluctant to perform as to, quote, or exhibit the fashions of dress. This is where I retract my blessing upon her. Uh, (laughs) But fashion plates were incredibly popular, and Hale started losing subscribers as competing magazines started publishing more of them. By late 1830, Hale realized that she really did have to include fashion plates if she wanted her magazine to stay afloat. So the first few issues that included fashion plates bemoaned the lack of original American fashions to feature, or offered commentary that criticized fashion, or printed an essay on the facing page that used the plate as some kind of moral lesson. Eventually, though, Hale moved on to publishing plates without all of the judgy commentary. And she was sort of like, if I have to do this, I'm just going to be as foot-draggy and complainy about it as I can. The irony is, though, she wore black her whole life because she thought it made her look stunning. So she was into (laughs) fashion. She just wouldn't acknowledge it. Yeah, and also the this magazine and then also uh, Goaty's Ladies Book, which we're going to talk about more in a bit. I mean, they became incredibly famous for all these fashion plates. So, Ladies Magazine stopped publishing fashion plates toward the very end of its run, but it's not clear whether that contributed to the magazine's decline. By 1834, the magazine had started to struggle, in part due to the financial fallout from President Andrew Jackson's efforts to try to dismantle the Bank of the United States. Hale started appealing to her subscribers to try to support the magazine and for the ones whose subscriptions were in arrears to pay their bills. So during these lean years, a man named Louis Antoine Godey approached Hale about moving to Philadelphia to edit his magazine. His name does appear French, but he was born in the U.S., so we're going with the Louis pronunciation. Godey was born in New York, as I said, in the U.S. on June 6, 1804. And like Hale, most of his education had come through self-study. He had owned a small bookstore and newsstand for a while before he became a scissors editor at the Philadelphia Daily Chronicle. In 1830, he started publishing a magazine called Ladies' Book, which was, like so many other magazines, created through clipping, and it also included fashion plates. But Godey also didn't want this magazine to just be your standard clipping shop. He wanted it to be, in his words, quote, the guiding star of female education, the beacon light of refined taste, pure morals, and practical wisdom. And he hoped that if he hired Hale, she could take it in that direction. In spite of her own magazine's struggles, Hale actually turned him down. This was largely because she didn't want to leave Boston. Her son William was about to start college at Harvard, and she didn't want to leave until he graduated. And she also wasn't quite ready to give up her own magazine. At this point, she was its co-owner. Hale had been very busy during her whole tenure as editor of American Ladies Magazine. She had written numerous books on top of all the writing she was doing for the magazine. This included publishing poems for our children, including Mary Had a Little Lamb, which was published in 1830. Its poems were, quote, written to inculcate moral truths and virtuous sentiments. She was also hugely active in fundraising efforts for the completion of the Bunker Hill Monument, and she helped found the Siemens Aid Society and become its first president. She kept up this pace as her magazine struggled, but she really was not able to turn things around. In 1836, Godey made another proposal, that he could buy American Ladies Magazine, merge it with his ladies book, and let Hale edit the combined magazine from Boston until her son William graduated from college in 1841. This time, Hale agreed. As of its first issue in 1837, she was the editor of Godey's Ladies Book, and she took it in a similar direction as she had taken American Ladies Magazine, which is what Godey had been hoping for, moving it away from clipping toward original content. 
Hale also focused on hiring women for as many roles as she could. Eventually, this included a staff of 150 women to hand-color the fashion plates. That means hand-coloring them for every copy of the magazine, (laughs) which was a feat and also meant that sometimes different people's copies would be in different colors because they ran out of one. Obviously, that's one of the things we said before that this magazine became really famous for. Also, in keeping with her distaste for covering fashion in a ladies' magazine at all, fashion was the only section of Godey's Ladies' Book that Hale did not personally oversee. There was a lot in the magazine beyond the fashion plates and other fashion coverage. Hale still wanted to, quote, provide quality material to benefit and educate the female reader. So, like her earlier magazine, Godey's Ladies' Book began publishing poetry, fiction, essays, biographical vignettes, news, advice, and household tips. She introduced stories and articles for children meant to be read to them by their mothers. Each issue included sheet music, and there were also sewing and embroidery patterns, also recipes, anything that Hale thought would be educational, edifying, and useful for American ladies. This meant that Godey's Ladies Book also became a publishing outlet for some of the United States' leading writers at the time. The magazine published work by Nathaniel Hawthorne, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and Washington Irving. Edgar Allan Poe was a contributor as well, publishing stories and poems, including The Cask of Amontillado. Under the leadership of Hale as editor and Godey as publisher, Godey's Ladies' Book became incredibly successful. We mentioned earlier that Hale's American Ladies' Magazine was the first women's magazine in the U.S. to last more than five years. Godey's Ladies' Book lasted for almost 70, from 1830 to 1898. It outlived both its editor and its publisher. It also became hugely popular. It had about 10,000 subscribers when Hale came on as editor. At its peak in 1860, it had about 150,000 subscribers, which was the largest circulation of any magazine in the United States at all. This was in spite of an annual subscription cost of $3, which was considered expensive for the time, It's always tricky to make these comparisons, but this is usually cited as between $85 and $90 a year today. It's also tricky to compare that to current magazine subscription rates because there are so many bundles and deals and digital-only subscriptions and whatnot, but the current bundle subscription rate for Vogue is $21.99 a year, and the cover price for a year of Martha Stewart Living is $49.90. That is according to each of their websites. It was also read well beyond its subscriber base. Its intended audience was ladies. In the mindset of the time, that meant white Protestant women who were mostly middle class or more affluent. But it was also read beyond that demographic, with women pooling their money to share a subscription or boarding houses sharing one copy among all its residents or patrons reading copies in libraries and reading rooms. So today, Godey's Ladies' Book is a huge source of information about middle-class white women in the 19th century, and it and Hale were also enormously influential, which we'll get to in a moment after a quick sponsor break. Like we've said a couple of times at this point, Sarah Josepha Hale and Godey's Ladies' Book were enormously influential. Under her leadership, the magazine reinforced several traditions that are a big part of life for many Americans today. Things like Christmas trees and white wedding dresses, which were being popularized in Britain thanks to Queen Victoria, were popularized in the United States thanks in part to Godey's Ladies Book. The first picture of a Christmas tree in the magazine's pages actually was copied from an engraving that had run in the Illustrated London News That engraving depicted Queen Victoria and her family around a Christmas tree. The Godey's version took out the Queen's crown and Albert's sash and mustache and some German biscuits from under the tree. Otherwise, though, it was the same picture, supposed to be an American family. (laughs) (laughs) The biggest and most obvious example of Hale's influence in this regard is the American Thanksgiving holiday. In the United States, Thanksgiving was already celebrated in various parts of the country, especially in the Northeast, before she became an editor. Hale started publicly advocating for a Thanksgiving holiday to be celebrated nationwide, and she began that quest in 1837. It was something that went on uh, within and outside the pages of Godey's Ladies' Book. But 
her interest in Thanksgiving as a holiday went back before that. She had written a lot about Thanksgiving before Godey's Ladies Book was even founded. There's a whole stretch in her first novel, Northwood, that's focused on Thanksgiving, including a New England family explaining to a visitor from elsewhere that it's not celebrated in the whole country, but hopefully one day will be, with one character saying, quote, Thanksgiving, like the 4th of July, should be considered a national festival and observed by all our people. The Thanksgiving meal is described in her writing this way, quote, The roasted turkey took precedence on this occasion, being placed at the head of the table. And well did it become its lordly station, sending forth the rich odor of its savory stuffing and finely covered with the froth of the basting. At the foot of the board, a sirloin of beef, flanked on either side by a leg of pork and loin of mutton, seemed placed as a bastion to defend innumerable bowls of gravy and plates of vegetables disposed in that quarter. A goose and pair of ducklings occupied side stations on the table, the middle being graced, as it always is on such occasions, by that rich burgomaster of the provisions called a chicken pie. This pie, which is wholly formed of the choicest parts of fowls, enriched and seasoned with a profusion of butter and pepper, and covered with an excellent puff paste, is, like the celebrated pumpkin pie, an indispensable part of a good and true Yankee Thanksgiving. The size of the pie usually denoting the gratitude of the party who prepares the feasts. And then it goes on to describe sideboards laden with a whole other course, plus a collection of desserts, including pumpkin pie. I have made some Thanksgiving meals, and thank goodness I did not have to make all of those different fowls. (laughs) (laughs) This is simultaneously familiar sounding to a lot of people in terms of the turkey and the pie and the vast quantity of food, but it also seems even bigger than like the -the over-the-top Thanksgivings that a lot of people have. Yeah, by the time we got to mutton, I was like, are you kidding me? (laughs) (laughs) This was also depicting a meal that was going to be for a whole lot of people, but still, it's it's a lot. There are other references to Thanksgiving and Hale's work after that, and then in 1837, she wrote an editorial in Godey's Ladies' Book that advocated a Thanksgiving holiday to be celebrated in every state on the last Thursday of November. She started contacting state governments with this proposal, along with contacting a series of U.S. presidents, continuing on until President Abraham Lincoln gave his Thanksgiving proclamation in 1863. That proclamation said in part, quote, it has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and prayer to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. At this point, the Thanksgiving holiday wasn't really associated with a romanticized first dinner involving the pilgrims and the Wampanoag. That association didn't really evolve until the late 19th and early 20th centuries, so a few decades after Lincoln issued his proclamation. And it was decades after that before Thanksgiving officially became a national holiday. That romanticized first Thanksgiving story was reinforced in the early 20th century through school lessons connecting it to ideas like freedom and good citizenship and construction paper pilgrim hats, in my case. Yeah, and problematic yeah, completely. Uh, head headdresses, yes. in quotation marks. So today, the first Thanksgiving story, and consequently the holiday as a whole, has been really criticized for erasing centuries of exploitation and genocide of North America's native peoples at the hands of colonists and the government. But even without that connection to that romanticized story, Hale's Thanksgiving campaign has its own problems. One of the reasons she was so dedicated to a national Thanksgiving holiday goes back to her thought that slavery might tear the nation apart. So she thought a national Thanksgiving holiday might help unify the nation in the face of its division over the issue of slavery. So in other words, she thought this holiday might help keep the country together without actually addressing the underlying issue of slavery. I have so many thoughts that I'm just going to keep in my head. Uh, Hale thought slavery was wrong, but she also didn't agree with radical opposition to it. 
She advocated the resettlement of enslaved Africans in Liberia, where they would be free, rather than the abolition of slavery within the United States. This resettlement plan, we have talked about it uh, on some episodes before, had a lot of advocates arguing from all kinds of perspectives, including people of African descent, who thought that this was the only way that they might truly be free, and people who were simply racist and wanted the enslaved population removed. For more detail, you can check out our previous episodes on Marcus Garvey and Thomas Morris Chester. So this same mindset also influenced the editorial direction of Godey's Ladies Book. When Hale was editing American Ladies magazine, she'd written various editorials that clearly stated her political opinions. But Godey wanted the ladies' book to appeal to women regardless of what their political views were. And of course, this wasn't a distinction he was consciously making in his mind, but the default woman here was white and usually middle class. He was also interested in, quote, avoiding nationalism or any political entanglements within the pages of the journal. And he also said, quote, I allow no man's religion to be attacked or sneered at or the subject of politics to be mentioned in my magazine. So sometimes you'll see Godey's Ladies Book described as not being political, but it would be more accurate to say that the magazine avoided overt political controversy. Really, it was incredibly political. It avoided direct discussion of the Civil War or the movement for abolition. That's an inherently political decision. Instead, in the years leading up to the U.S. Civil War, it published poetry, essays, and stories that highlighted the potential tragedies of war and also emphasized the idea of national unity. Although the hope was that this would avoid offending either side, in reality, it meant that the magazine's readership peaked in 1860, just before the war. Afterward, people started gravitating toward publications where they could get news about what was happening. On top of that, in a different political direction, Godey's Ladies' Book heavily reinforced a very specific idea of what a woman should be. Sarah Josepha Hale believed that women were more moral and compassionate than men were. In Hale's words, quote, God has given to man authority to woman influence. She wanted women to influence men to be better so that men could put their authority to better use. The magazine focused on the idea that a woman's role given by God was to be a moral force in her sphere of influence, which was the home. Although the magazine never took a clear position one way or the other, Hale herself was against the idea of women's suffrage because it was outside of women's sphere of influence and because women had fewer opportunities for education and political engagement, thus they were less likely to be informed voters. Instead, Godey's Ladies' Book really enforced the idea that a true woman was pious, pure, submissive, and domestic, a collection of ideas known as the cult of true womanhood or the cult of domesticity. Yeah, that's come up in a few episodes lately, including Packard versus Packard. It was an incredibly common idea of what a woman was supposed to be at the time, and elements of it continue to today. Hale did advocate for better opportunities for women, but only within this framework. This included supporting Elizabeth Blackwell and her efforts to become the first woman in the United States to earn an MD. In Hale's mind, medicine could be within a woman's sphere. In her words, written in March of 1852, quote, the study of medicine belongs to a woman's department of knowledge. Its practice is in harmony with the duties of mother and nurse, which she must fulfill. It is not going out of her sphere to prescribe for the sick. She must do this by the fireside, the bedside, in the inner chamber where her true place is. It is man who is there out of his sphere. Hale also advocated for women to have better educational opportunities, especially when it came to an education in the liberal arts. She was a huge advocate for Vassar Female College after its founding in 1861, as well as corresponding extensively with its founder, Matthew Vassar, on everything from the student's dress to the number of female faculty to whether to keep the word female in the name. But there were also a lot of limits to Hale's advocacy for women's education, all connecting back to the idea of a, what a woman's sphere was. For example, she didn't seem to think that women should study the physical sciences for their own sake. Various articles in Godey's Ladies Book suggest that science has a use in a woman's life, like how understanding scientific concepts can help her keep a better home, but it doesn't really support the idea that a woman should just become a chemist or a physicist because she wants to. 
And there were also limits to which women she was writing for and depicting in the magazine. The women in the magazine's famous fashion plates, some of which were large enough that they were printed on fold-out pages, were all white and all affluent, with similarly attractive features and the same slender body type. They reinforced the ideas of heterosexual marriage and motherhood as unifying forces in women's lives. Really, for most of its existence, the the magazine didn't address the experience of Native people or enslaved people or free Black people or immigrants at all. In the words of a piece in the July 1897 issue, which was after Hale and Godey had both died, quote, a little over a century ago, colored women had no social status. And indeed, only 30 years ago, the term womanhood was not large enough in this Christian republic to include any woman of African descent. That's from a piece that was clearly written for white women to let them know that, quote, the thousands of cultured and delightfully useful women of the colored race who are worth knowing and who are prepared to cooperate with white women in all good efforts are simply up-to-date new women in the best sense of that much-abused term. Uh, Even so, the magazine was widely read and widely respected. In the words of the Philadelphia City item in 1870, quote, it has been well remarked that where Godey's is taken, there is domestic neatness, comfort, elegance, virtue, which we think is saying a good deal for the American woman. God bless Godey's and keep it with us many years. Godey sold the publication to John Hill Sayers Hallenbeek in 1877 after he and Hale both retired. As of their retirement, she was 89 and he was 73. So they worked on this magazine almost until the end of their lives. Louis Antoine Godey died the following year on November 29th, 1878. Sarah J. Hale, who called herself an editress, died on April 30th, 1879. She had continued to write for much of her life, publishing poems, fiction, essays, recipe books, etiquette manuals, and a women's encyclopedia titled Woman's Record or Sketches of All Distinguished Women from the Creation to A.D. 1854, arranged in four eras, with selections from female writers of every age. Uh, That was all the title. But in her day, she was so associated with Godey's Ladies Book that people called it Mrs. Hale's Magazine. I feel like she's pretty complicated. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I want to like her in some ways, but that whole, like, nose down at fashion thing is a problem. (laughs) And then her... It's the funny thing where just as as the magazine was... um, claiming that it did not take a political stance, but obviously did uh, because of its refusal to acknowledge certain things. I feel like similarly, and obviously on a much more important level, that's also how she dealt with fashion, right? She's like, I don't want fashion, which is in itself a commentary on fashion. Right. Uh, And she would consult on women's apparel at Vassar, but didn't want fashion involved It's a fascinating thing to me. (laughs) (laughs) He's got a lot of contradictions. You can, there are scans of a lot of these, a lot of issues of this book that you can see online. Um, You can read through. I mean, they're just, they goes, it goes on for years. There's pages and pages of stuff you can dive into if you were interested in little glimpses of life for 19th century white women slash the kinds of standards that the magazine was really heavily reinforcing. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.